Hey, Nerdy Knitters. Welcome to the Knitting 411 podcast where we discuss your knitting questions and answers. If you're here, why don't you pop in the chat and say hello? Tell me what's on your knittles. <laughs> See if I can get my words out right. Let's try that again. Why don't you pop in the chat, say hello. Get me back on the screen here. And tell me what's on your knitting needles this week. <laughs> and while we're doing that, we'll jump right in. Um, the weather's a bit crazy here today. We've got thunder shower warnings in effect, and the wind is absolutely insane. I heard a loud crash about 15 minutes ago and had to go out and rescue a lawn chair that had decided to just travel across the lawn. But so if something happens and we've got lightning and thunder, we might have to end early, but hopefully not. I've got lots planned today. We're going to talk about sweater knitting. We've got a lot to cover. I had some great questions submitted about sweater knitting. So we're going to do like a deep dive and do a big overview of the process, how sleeves are added, the ways they can be constructed. There is lots to do. But before we do that, we'll do the podcasty bits and I'll talk about some knitting news and chat and what is on my needles this week. Let me share my screen here. There we go. As always, we have a few resources available for you, a free uh, read your knitting stitches guide that you can download. There's the URL right there and quick knitting tips. Sometimes you just want a quick refresher on how to do a cast on or a bind off. And I've got a whole selection of knitting shorts. They're 60 seconds or less. The one I just published this week is all about garter stitch. So if you're a new knitter and you're trying to learn the difference between all of these stitches, garter, stockinette, and all of that, and you're not sure what that means, we're going to be talking about those over the next few weeks. So you can go check out that in that shorts list. And let's move on right to the first thing, our knitting news and chat. This week, the thing that, that I found was something called... Um, Victorian knitting manuals. I love knitting books and I love to look at old knitting patterns and old knitting books to see how things have changed throughout history. And I happened to come across this article about, um, let me see if I can read it here. Um, the author of the history of hand knitting, his name is Richard Rutt. Uh, I used that book when I, I had to write a report about the history of knitting think for level two of the master hand knitting program last year. And I used that as a major resource while I was looking into all of the, the overview of knitting and how it started and the history and all of that. And he has a he had a huge collection of knitting books and manuals that he had collected over the years and he donated them to um, the University of Southampton, I believe. Um, yes in England and he wanted to join it with Monsey Stanley's knitting collection. And um, I've probably mentioned her before. I really like this book by her, The Knitter's Handbook. Let me see, get me back up there. This book right here, it's out of print, but you can find used copies all over the place. So what it was very interesting to read that he wanted his books to join the resources she had collected as well. And what's really interesting is these old books and manuals you can find online as well, right here. If you go to this URL, archive.org, this is a direct link to the University of Southampton, their, uni their knitting reference library. And you can look at all of these books yourself. You can click on each one and you can flip right through them right online and look at all of them. So if you have a love of history or well, knitting history and you like to see what knitting was like in the past and what the patterns and the books would have been like, then this resource, there's so much there that you can really get lost in all of those resources. Okay, before we pop over, let me see who's here. Oh goodness, we've got lots of people. Marina is here. Hey, Marina and Franca. It's good to see you, Franca. I know you, you've missed the last few, so I'm glad to see you here. And Kaz, it's great to see you guys joining me today. Rainy South Yorkshire. Yes, we're about to get some rain here too. I think we're gonna get some thunder showers. I'm hoping it'll hold off long enough until we can get through our live stream today. So what's everybody been working on? Kaz is knitting a shawl, but it's going to be a blanket. Or are you just going to keep knitting and knitting until it keeps growing and growing? 
Marina, Franca, whoever else is here, why don't you tell us what you've been working on? And I'll share what I've been knitting. Let me go over to, let me see, this one. There we go. Um, while I was waiting for the live stream to start, get that off there. Um, I started a new shawl. Let's see if I can dig it out. It's um, this yarn right here. It's sort of like a Karen Skinny Cakes yarn. So it's like a DK uh, Craft Yarn Council 3, I think. So it just it changes, not a gradient, but it um, self-striping, I guess, is what it would be. Um, so I thought it would be fun to knit something where you like sort of choose your own adventure. Whenever the color changes, you change to a different stitch pattern. So I have like um, basic garter stitch and basic stockinette and then interspersed with these other stitch patterns. So every time the color changes, I change to a different stitch pattern. I mean, doing stockinette between each one and then a different texture. And it's a, I think it's probably called like an arrow or a chevron shawl. Make this a little bigger. Oops. There we go. Where there are garter stitch edges and then decreases worked here and then increases worked in the center. So it sort of goes off to both sides like that. So it's really fun. Every time the colors change, I switch to a different stitch pattern. And it's pretty fun. So I'm probably going to turn this into a, a knitting pattern when I'm finished. That's what's on my needles right now. And along with, let me see what else is on my needles. I'm knitting some summer tops. So this is Buttercup, I think. Yeah, Buttercup by... Um, Heidi Kiermeyer, I think is her name. The link for this is down in the video description box. This is a top down raglan. I just joined the front. So I was knitting flat to get the shape and then start, oh, I got it upside down here. And then added this front piece. So it's got a little feather and fan section. So I know it's bright lime green. You're not going to miss me when you see me in this top, but I wanted something a little longer in tunic length for summer. So that's on the go right now. And for finished things, I finished this blue shawl, well, a scarf. Um, I only had a little bit left to do and I just finished that up. I had the roughly end to do. So this will be coming out probably in August or maybe September. I'm not sure when I get the pattern finished. I still have to block this but it's all finished being knit and the last thing that I finished is a tutorial that will be out this week um, I wanted to do something about lace and reading charts and this is a really basic stitch pattern that only uses yarn overs and a double decrease but it's a large pattern so it was too small for or the the stitch pattern was too big for a dishcloth so I thought a small dish towel instead so I'll be working on the video for that this week, but that part is done, the actual towel itself. So just a little hand towel. That was a really quick knit. So if you wanna learn how to knit lace with just a really simple project, this will be up in a few weeks. There, okay, let me get back on the screen. So my needles have been busy this week. So let's see, what have you guys been knitting? We know that Kaz is knitting that shawl. That's going to be a blanket. <laughs> I like big shawls, though, because they're really nice and warm and cuddly in the winter. I don't like little tiny shawls. I want a big, cuddly one. And Marina is knitting a headband. You know what? I want to try those um, the cable ones that cross in the front. They have sort of that crisscrossy thing. I think that's a, a headband that looks interesting. I'd like to try one of those. Franca, you want to knit a sweater, but it looks scary, so you're knitting another blanket. Well, in today's video, I've got some recommendations for you for some first sweaters. And also, we're just, we're gonna talk a lot about sweaters today. That's coming up. And Marina, you've done a headband, you're working on a blanket, you are busy. Oh, thank you, yes, I'm glad you like the shawl. Good question. The difference between gradient, variegated, self-striping. Ooh, that's a big question. So gradient is usually like um, one color and you move through like a spectrum. Say if it's purple, you might move through like a pale 
pink to a lilac to a darker purple. That's more of a gradient. You're moving along one color to different hues and shades for one color. Variegated can be any mix of colors, and but it repeats over really short lengths from like maybe even just a few inches. It might be a few inches of yellow and then a few inches of blue and a few inches of purple up to maybe like even a foot of each color all in one skein. And then self-striping is, well, self-striping sock yarn, they're very particular about usually the, the width of each stripe. So you get really exact stripes, but I'm not sure the one that I show here, what that would be called, if that would be referred to as a, because it is a self striping, I guess, but they're wider stripes. Let's see what the, well, this is what it, what it is anyway. Um, lime twist is the color. Doesn't really say what it's called, but I would refer to it as a self striping, I would think. But I mean, just bigger stripes than you would get in like a sock yarn. That hand towel, would, oh yes, it would. Um, if you look for a horseshoe lace, that's the name of the stitch pattern. It's a really classic lace, very easy stitch pattern. I think it's like eight row repeat and 10 stitches across. It's really very simple. And there's lots of different ways it's been used. But I wanted to make a washcloth, but it was just too big for, a, for a, like a dishcloth or a washcloth. So I thought a little towel instead, that would be a good way to practice it. All right. Okay. While I still have my other camera set up, I'm going to, let's see if I can get that. There we go. Um, I haven't done much for master knitting. Somebody did ask about that, if I would talk more about that, but most of all of my swatches except two are done. I have one more. I've got the la a lace doily I have to do. I haven't even looked at that one yet because I don't have the yarn for it. Um, and then I have one more. I have to use twisted stitches and I'm getting a little bit of a glare there. So I have this book that I just picked up from Schoolhouse Press. It's a reprint of these three, I think they're German books, I'm not sure, um, by Maria Erlbacher. And it's filled with lots of stitch patterns. And she has her own method of charting. So I'm learning a different way to chart. But all of the stitches, I don't know if you can see them but they're twisted they're all knit through the back loop so you get really twisted stitches and a lot of them you have to um, purl them through the back loop on the back row too on the, the wrong side of the work so you really have to pay attention to what you're doing so I'm making a chart for that right now and hopefully next week I'll get there's another one. Oh, that's a really pretty one I'll get the the swatch made and then I've been putting off my projects I've got to knit a hat and a scarf, not a scarf, a hat and a sweater. So I'm going to do uh, an Erin cabled sweater. My daughter wants one, so I told her I'd knit her one. And a uh, Fair Isle Tam for the hat. I sort of got some ideas for the hat, so I'll probably tackle that first, but that's probably going to be my summer fall projects or getting those big garments done for the master knitting program. And then maybe then I'll sit down and really make a video about that. It's been a lot of work and there's lots of different techniques in this level, so I'm learning a lot of new things this year. And while I've got this out, um, we'll move right to resources. I love to show knitting books. I am a nerdy knitter and I like knitting books. Um, so I thought I would show some that I picked up from the library this week. I have a really great library here. And these are all, I think they're all by the same person. Yeah, Judith Durant. Um, they are one skein books. If you have a bit of a stash or you like small one skein projects, sometimes like if I'm on a, on a trip or a vacation, I know we haven't done that for a while, but, um, and you like to buy, I like to buy like a skein of yarn. If I go somewhere, um, I might not buy like enough for a sweater, but I might buy just one sort of as a memory for the trip. So sometimes I'm looking for a project that uses just one skein or small projects. And all of these books do that. This one is specifically for sock yarn, which is usually what I buy. I like to buy a skein of sock yarn. But then sometimes you don't really want to knit socks with it. Well, this book is full of ideas. I think get to the table of contents here. 
for this one, for sock yarn, there's head to toe and fingers too. So hats and caps, mittens, gloves, cuffs and socks, scarves and shawls and shrugs, things for kids, bags. So if you have sock yarn in your stash, then this might be a good book to pick up. And then there's this one, Luxury Yarn, One Skein Wonders, which is the same idea, small projects. Oh, this one has pictures right in the front. Nice. Pretty lacy scarves and shawls. Oh, and even some crochet. And then this is the original in the series, I think, One Skein Wonders. And it's not just a uh, sock or fingering yarn. Um, Bulky weight, heavy worsted, worsted, sport weight. So all different weights of yarn, but just one skein. So if you have a stash, those might be good for you to pick up. Let's see, did I miss anything over here? Oh, Franca, you wanna know what the book is called? I'm guessing this first one that I showed. Twisted Stitch Knitting by Maria Erlbacher. I'll try to put this one. It's not in the description down below, but I'll put it down there. It's from Schoolhouse Press. So I know you can order it from them directly. I think I think I found it on Amazon too. I'm pretty sure that's where I got it. But it is, it was originally in, I can't remember if it's German or, but it was three different books and they combined the three and reprinted it in English. But it's a really interesting book, especially if you really like twisted stitches, which, or if you just like to do some of your own designing, the designs in here are very pretty. There. That's a lot of books. <laughs> but I got, I got these one skein books from the library because I was looking at um, doing a couple videos on some ideas for using those one skeins when you're not sure what to do or stash busting kind of projects and things like that. So let me get that out of the way. So that's all I've been knitting. Okay. Um, I think we already showed what everybody else was knitting. You guys are having fun in the chat, I see. So let's look. There we go. All right, last week's community question was on, there we go, was on knitting books to see if anybody else liked knitting books as much as I did. And we didn't have any comments, but we had a lot of responses to the poll and about 50% don't have any books. So tell me if you're in the chat, if you have any knitting books. Um, I thought that was interesting. About half the people don't have any knitting books, and then there's some who have a few, and then five or ten, and some who are pretty nerdy like me and have 20 or more. I do have, well, goodness, I've got most of mine right here, and there's definitely more than 20 there. And I have a lot more on my wish list as well. <laughs> Need to see. Oh, yes. Um, I'm not sure if the Twisted Stitch book is available as an ebook, I would love it if Schoolhouse Press would start releasing some of their books as ebooks. I do too, Franca. I really, because I, we live in a small house, so I try to be selective about the books I buy, and I have quite a lot of ebooks that I prefer to. And they're nice and portable as well, which is really nice. Okay, so let's move into our questions for the week. And as we're discussing these, if you have more questions that come up, then just pop them in the chat. And when we talk, when we finish with these, we'll address all of those. You can see we've got, they're all about sweater knitting this week. So I thought before we dove into each one, we would um, address like sort of an overview of sweaters because everybody's at a different place. Some are just knitting their first sweater maybe, or somebody might have knit a few, but They've knit maybe just a raglan sleeve and they want to explore other sleeve types. Then we're going to break it down into a few things. Let me just grab a drink of water real quick. Okay, so we're going to break this into three parts. Sweaters can be constructed in many, many different ways. I'm sure you know that from looking at all of the different patterns. But it starts with the direction of the knitting. You can start at the hem 
and work up to the collar. You can start at the collar and work down to the hem. What's not on this list is even sweaters that are knit from side to side. Sometimes you can start at one sleeve and knit across to the other sleeve. But I wanted to keep it really basic. So we're keeping it just to the basic things. But I'd mention that one because there are even more ways that sweaters can be constructed. Knitters are very, um, what's the word, ingenious? No, there's inventive <laughs> and come up with new things all of the time. Um, but along with that, the direction of the knitting is the actual construction method. They can be seamless, which I say with sort of air quotes because it's not totally, it doesn't have to totally be seamless, but that would mean it's worked in the round. Um, but sometimes you might still have seams at your shoulders, but we still refer to it as seamless because it's worked mostly in one piece and then the sleeves are worked in pieces and added or started at the top and worked down. Or it can be seamed where you knit each piece flat on their own and then you seam them up. So we have the direction of the knitting, we have the construction method, but the major part of a sweater is the yoke and the sleeves. Like what I'm wearing right now, I mean, this one would be considered, it's a bit loose actually, but it would be considered a set in sleeve. I should have made it one size smaller, I think. But the sleeve is set right into the side back to that screen. Then there are seamless yoke sweaters. If you've ever seen those pretty sweaters that have like lots of color work right here, that would be a yoke sweater. Then you have raglan sweaters. Um, I have one that I'm knitting that would, I just showed you earlier, Buttercup, that starts out with um, set points for your increases or your decreases. And then set in sleeves like this, or if you have like a, a, t a fitted t-shirt where the, the seam for the sleeve is right on your shoulder, that would be a set in sleeve. A drop or a modified drop shoulder, think of like an oversized sweatshirt where the sleeve seam is on your arm somewhere. And then saddle shoulder. So there are actually more ways to put sleeves on a sweater, but those are the most common. And we really wanna stick with the basics today. So we have the direction, we have the construction, and the yoke in the sleeves. I'm going to show you some examples of all of these. We'll start with some seamless garments. There's a link for each of these if you want to go check them out, and I put a link in the video description down below too, so you can look at each one. But this just shows you this seamless, what we call knitting in the round. Two of these, uh, flax and the last one, cumulus, are, or cumulus, they're both started at the collar and worked top down, but the sleeves are constructed differently. The last one is a color work yoke where you're adding your increases along set points between all of the color work designs. And the first one, the raglan, you have your set points um, on the front and on the back, and that increases for your sleeves and for the front and the back at the same time. But then the one in the middle is also seamless, but it starts at the bottom and it worked up, it's worked up to the top and you stop when you get to the, the armholes and you work the front and the back separately and then bind them off together. And then you have seamed garments and here's two more examples. Now these are both worked in pieces and they're both worked from the bottom up. I think most garments that are worked in pieces and then seamed are worked from the bottom up. I'm sure not, there's probably some that aren't, but most that I've seen are, when they're worked in pieces, they're usually worked from the hem up to the neckline. And the blue sweater here has a set in sleeve. You can see where the, the, the seam of the sleeve sits right along the shoulder. And the gray sweater is what's called a saddle shoulder. I don't know if you can see the picture very well, but it's sort of like an extra piece of fabric that sits between the front and the back and it seemed to do those pieces and, and connects them. And this, is, this construction is used quite often when it's something with a lot of cables like Aran sweaters and things like that. You'll often see saddle shoulders like that. I thought it would be better to see it in something plain so you can really see the seams though. So those are all of the ways that you can, let me get back to our questions here. So those are the basic ways to construct a sweater. You can see there's a lot that goes into it, but 
any you change any of these details and you have a different sweater to say that you want to knit a, a seamless raglan you have a choice you can start at the top you can start at the bottom and work your way up or you can knit everything flat and seam it together afterwards um i think the only one in this list you can't do that with would be a seamless yoke sweater i've never seen one of those worked flat before i think you i'm sorry i suppose you could knit the body flat and then add the the yoke after but i've never seen that done they're usually done in the round but the rest, there, there's so many variations. You can work them top down, bottom up, seamless, seamed. Set in sleeves can be worked in both directions. So that's the basic overview of a sweater. Now we're gonna dive into these questions that everybody had. But the thing with these questions is some of them are very broad. Like Franca had a question. She wants to know how to make a sweater on circular needles and as you could see just from our examples of how sweaters are constructed with the different sleeves, there's more than one way to do it. Um, so it's it would take a long time to answer that question specifically, but it really comes down to the type of design you would like to have where basically the, the sweater, the, the way the sleeves are attached because everything else can be easily adjusted, like the, the length of the sweater itself, the length or the shape of the sleeves, adding waist or bust shaping, all of that can be changed, but you can't really move, you can't change a, um, a set in sleeve to a raglan sleeve without a lot of math. So you, I, I would choose a garment based on the type of sleeve construction you like, or if you wanna do a color work yoke, or then choose a yoke type sweater or something like that. But there are some really simple things that we can look at if you really want a basic beginner sweater pattern i have two examples here tin can knits flax that was in that first picture we showed of the three sweaters or a uh, very pink knits has a learn to knit a woman's t-shirt that was the first sweater i ever knit and it was really simple easy to follow she's got a great tutorial they're both top down raglans so you can try them on as you're knitting them which is nice for a first sweater when you're just learning how to knit them if you're more adventurous, you can look into Elizabeth Zimmerman's percentage system. I have a link there for that to knit picks. There's a picture of, of um, the overview of it, basically. You start, you, of course, you'd have to knit a gauge swatch for this. And you decide how wide you want your sweater to be. And that would be your 100% of your stitches. And then you use different percentages of, the, of that number to create the rest of the garment. So you start at the bottom with the hem and you work your way up and then you would work each of the sleeves depending with a certain percentage of that stitch number and then you would join them all together work the yoke to the neck and she also has this method for top down construction as well so if you're really adventurous and you want to try knitting just from the numbers that is a good place to start okay now this was a big question and I know it's a common question that a lot of people have. When I knit sweaters, I have to pick up stitches along the top of the sweater to create the neckband and I never get it right. Is there an easy way to figure out which stitches to pick up when creating a neckband? Now there's a lot that goes on with this question as well, but it comes down to two things. How many stitches you need to pick up and where they need to be picked up. And the how many stitches is an interesting one because most patterns will tell you how many stitches to pick up. But that is dependent on the row gauge in the pattern. And if your row gauge is different, then the stitch number that you should pick up is going to be different. And for something simple like garter stitch, this doesn't make such a difference. But if you have to knit in like a knit one purl one rib or something like that, then you have to know a little bit of math you have to realize that you need a multiple of two stitches and probably one extra so you can begin and end with a knit stitch but what you need to do is know your row gauge and if you're knitting a garment then hopefully you've knit a gauge swatch and you can use that that's a tip at the bottom that i have at the bottom there actually use the side of that to practice picking up the stitches for your ratio to see how many stitches you should pick up. And a really simple way to figure this out is once you know your gauge, your gauge swatch measurements, then you can use that to decide how many stitches to pick up. And I have a little swatch here that shows 
and we're going to actually pick some up. I'm going to demonstrate it right here. But what I did was I took the measurements from my little swatch and I know I have a gauge of five stitches and seven rows to the inch. So I'm going to use that as my foundation, my ratio for picking up stitches. I'm going to pick up five stitches for every seven rows. And you can do the exact same thing when you're trying to de determine how many stitches you should pick up if your row gauge is different from that of the designer, or if you've adjusted the pattern at all, perhaps you've made it longer and you have more rows, then you're gonna have to pick up more stitches. So you need to know your gauge. So all you do is figure out your stitch and your row gauge for one inch, and that is your ratio. So like my example, I have five stitches in seven rows, so I'm going to pick up five stitches for every seven rows. And we do this because if you look at your knitting, you'll notice that the stitches are wider than they are tall. They're not particularly square, they're more rectangular. So when you turn things sideways and you have to start picking up along that, that edge right there, then those wide stitches, if you tried to pick up one for every stitch along that vertical edge, then you're going to pucker this up right there. So you have to pick up fewer stitches per rows because they are wider than they are tall. That's a mouthful. <laughs> okay, so now that we know how many, and you know that you can use your stitch and row gauge to determine how many you should pick up, we're going to look at where you should pick them up. And there are three places. There's the horizontal edge, which would be right down here. And you can see they've been bound off in little stair steps. That would be horizontally. Curved edges where you have to do, do decreases along a set point. And then vertical edges right there. So we're going to take a closer look at that right now. Okay, so when you're picking up, you've got those three places you need to pick up. And I've done that in this sample here. You work, you pick up along a horizontal edge and along a curved edge and along a vertical edge. Now we'll start with a horizontal. When you're picking up from a horizontal edge, you're going to not think about your ratio. You're going to pick up one stitch for every stitch because you're just continuing the knitting you can see there's a column of stitches those v's are our stitches and they continue right up into the rib so we want to continue them and they follow just like that so you want to pick up one stitch for every stitch that you've bound off let me find my yarn here so let me show you how you would do that you have to know how to read your stitches of course and we're looking for our V's. I'll start with this one right here. I'm going to ignore that seamed one. Like say I'm going to seam that later. So we're just going to ignore it and start here. So there's the first V. There's the bind off edge right there. We don't want that. We look for that ver first V right here. And we insert our needle right in the middle of that V. And pull our stitch through. Oops, split my yarn. Okay. And then you would continue across. Look for the next V. It's right here. Insert. Wrap the yarn. Right there. And the next V. Back in frame. Sorry about that. Wrap. Look for the next stitch under the bind off row. Okay. And one more right here. And then you can see there's sort of a jog, like it moves up. We do not enter this hole right there. If you insert into a hole and pull it through, you just make that hole bigger. So, well, first of all, it's between two stitches, so that's why there's a hole there. Look for your V. The V is over here. And then we've got where we, we bound off on the next row, so we sort of have to stair step up. We skip this hole. This is our next column of stitches right here. And we don't want to keep going in a straight line because our edge, our, 
our neckline is sort of moving up in that direction. So we're going to follow that slant. So we look for that next column of stitches right here. We look for that bind off row right there, and we're going to pick that stitch on right underneath it and wrap. If I can find my yarn. Oops, I've been using my tail for this. Grab the other end. And you would continue doing that. So I'm going to just do this a little more quickly now. Not there, that's a hole. There's our row right there. Column of stitches. And then we're moving up. That was another bind off section, not in the hole. Look for the next column. So you're picking up and you're continuing. Oops, I missed that one. You're continuing that row of stitches. And when you look at your work, you'll see that your yarn is right in the middle of that column of V's. For each one, you should have a stitch. So that is along a horizontal edge or even a stair step edge. Then you can see we're going to start moving into a section where I had some decreases and it's sort of slanting. You might see that on a V-neck. Let me see. I've got one more here. And this is where we would start moving into our ratio because we're not picking up depending. We're not picking up one for one now. That's only for a horizontal edge. You pick up one stitch for every bound off stitch. Now we're going to start using our ratio, and my stitch gauge was five stitches and seven rows, so that's the ratio I'm going to use. I'm going to pick up five stitches for every seven rows. And you have a choice. You can look. Like, I could decide to put my needle right there and pull it through, but I can see that that's going to leave a hole if I decide to pick up right there. So I don't want that. I'm going to skip that spot and go up to the next one. And the next thing to think about is where you pick them up. Now that you know how to do a horizontal, on a vertical edge, you have columns of stitches, and you want to leave a full stitch at the edge. You can see it's kind of wonky looking, that first stitch. But right here on this edge is my stitch. The second stitch in is where I did my decreases. So that line right in the middle is where I want to pick up. I'm going to avoid this hole here. So I'm going to pick up right between this stitch and this whole stitch on the edge right there. And I'll keep doing that. You can see if you pull it apart, there's little bars in there. Those are the horizontal bars that connect the stitches. So for every seven rows, I'm going to pick up five of those. And if one, like that one looks really big and gappy right there, so I'm going to skip that one. There's nothing that says you have to pick up every single one. So there's two. I'll skip that one. Three. And that one's kind of big too, so I'll skip that. That was... Okay, so there's four, and I skipped two, that's five, so I really should pick up the next two to make sure I keep my gauge or my, my ratio correct. And that's it. And then you would continue with your next five stitches and seven rows. Kind of a big hole there, so I'll skip that one and pick up a stitch here. And the next one. And one more, and then this next spot looks like a big hole again, so I'll skip that. And that is all there is to it. You just use your ratio to determine. Oh, that one's kind of big, so I'll skip that one. And we've picked them all up, just like that. And then you would follow your pattern. It would tell you if you were supposed to do a, a rib or garter stitch or something like that. You'd have your stitches picked up, and you would just start working in your pattern. And if you find that you don't like the way it's looking, then you can pull it out and do it again. Like I probably could have picked up another one or two stitches along this curve to help with that. There, so I hope that answers that question about um, picking up stitches for a neckline. It really, it's, it can seem daunting, but it is not. I mean, if, if you don't like the way it looks, you just pull it out and you do it again. And the best thing you can do is if you have knit a gauge swatch, then check your gauge, figure out your ratio, and then use your swatch to practice picking up stitches to make sure it looks right. It's not too puckered or too flat or stretched out. And just give it a go. Once you've done it a few times, you'll find it's easier than you think it is. 
So let's move on to our next question. Emily wanted to know about doing V-necks in the round. And yes, you can do V-necks in the round. That's the sweater I'm, well, it's not a V-neck. Let me move my things here. This one is more of a scoop boat neck, but it's the same idea. Make it started up here along the neckline and you have to work back and forth in rows and then you would join it. In this case, it was a larger panel, but if you were doing a V-neck, you would just join it right there and you would start knitting in the round. So like our examples here, we've got a top down and a bottom up. These are both seamless, so they are worked in the round. The one on the right is raglan, raglan sleeve and the one on the left is a set and sleeve and there's links to both of those if you wanna check them out down below in the video description box. But so for the top down, you would start by working flat back and forth in rows. You would cast on the certain number of stitches and then you would probably work increased stitches to create the V-neck. And then when it's the depth and the shape it's supposed to be, you would finish casting on maybe a few stitches and then you would join and start working the rest of the body in the round. And then it would be reversed if you were working bottom up. You would work up to probably the armholes and then you would stop and you would probably start working flat. You might even do the front and the back separately to create the V-neck shape and then bind off the shoulders or it could still be done in the um not separately, but one piece, but you would still have to go back and forth in rows to create the V-neck. Okay, and we had one more question. Marina wanted to know, um, in the last, in our last um, episode, our podcast, she asked this question about connecting sleeves. She wants to make a sweater, but she didn't know how to connect sleeves. And that's another question like um, knitting a whole sweater on circular needles. It is a huge question. It's a really big question and it comes down to the type of sleeve that you want to knit. Um, for the seamless, like a yoke or a raglan, those are just added as you knit the rest of the sweater and then you would go back and pick up the stitches and finish them. But I'm, I'm guessing from her question, she wants to know more about how to seam them. So if you did like a set and sleeve, like this sweater, I knit in pieces and then I had to put the, the sleeve, which is sort of a rounded shape, set it in there and make sure it was seamed in properly. But it, it starts with understanding how to seam stitches and rows together. Let me see, I've got this, put this up there again. Now this is sort of a simulation, say for a drop shoulder sweater, you would knit your, your sweater body and your sleeve, and then you would be seaming the, the stitches to the rows, basically. And like our ratio for picking up stitches, because stitches are wider than they are tall, we have to determine how to put those two pieces together so they don't pucker and bunch up. You can see I worked a seam here, but this video that I've linked You'll find the link for this down below. Suzanne Bryan covers this in major depth, the steps for seaming something. So once you know how to put those pieces together, you can apply it to any sweater pattern at all. So once you understand how to seam stitches to rows, you can pick any drop shoulder sweater pattern and they are super simple to add the, the sleeves. It's just a straight line, just one simple straight line. So if you wanna do a seamed sweater, I would suggest you start with a drop shoulder sweater because it's just that. There's nothing else involved. For a set in sleeve, the, the sleeve is a rounded sleeve and you have to sort of shimmy it in there and figure out how to, to fit it in. And it takes a little more work. It's not that much more difficult, but a drop shoulder is much easier. So if anybody has any knitting questions, that was the last of, last of our questions to answer. You can put your questions in the chat. And I'm going to get another quick drink.
<clears throat> and Franca, you have the Knitting Bible on ebook. I don't think I've heard of that one. Can you tell me who the author is? I'd like to look that one up. That sounds interesting. Okay, I'm just going to scroll through and see if I missed any questions. It does not look like it. So for our community question this week, I didn't really have a specific question, but I thought we would discuss what we want to talk about in upcoming episodes of the podcast. So I don't know, because we just did a overview of the sweater knitting process. So if somebody wants to dive deeper into a specific, like say we just want to discuss raglan sweaters or set in sleeve sweaters or, or just particular, goodness, even sleeve shapes or lengths, anything like that. Let me know if you want to talk about that or if you'd like to move on to something else like reading charts. And we could talk about swatching and gauge or we could talk about reading knitting patterns. If you have other recommendations, go ahead and drop them in the chat too. But I thought we would pick with one of these options. So let me know what you would like to discuss in our upcoming episodes. And we will perhaps focus on just one topic and you can submit your questions for that one topic and we can focus on that that way. Oh, and we have a few questions. Favorite method for knitting socks? That's a great question, Deanne. Do you have a favorite method for knitting socks? And anybody, if, you, if you've if you knit socks and you have a method, drop it in the chat and tell us about it. Or if you're watching the replay, put it in a comment and tell us about your favorite method. Um, I've tried lots of different methods. I've, I'm partial to two at a time on Magic Loop toe up because I have size nine feet and I like to make sure I can get both of my socks out of one skein of yarn. So if I, I try to divide the ball of yarn into two and then we'll do them both at the same time and then I can make sure they perfectly match and I have enough yarn to make sure they're both going to be the same length because it's no fun to knit one and then find out you ran out of yarn and you don't have enough to finish the second sock, <laughs> especially for those with big feet like me. Um, but I did get some Addy Flexi Flips and I've started knitting with those. I still prefer toe up. And I like shorty socks because I can definitely get two, I can get a pair of socks out of one skein of yarn that way. Um, and Addy Flexi Flips are nice for a change, but I just have to be careful that I pay attention to write down everything so the second sock ends up exactly like the first. So probably those two methods are, are my two favorites. Um, I like short row heels for myself, my husband, a uh, heel flap and gusset fits his heel better. And there's so many ways to knit, goodness, the toes and the heels. And it'd be fun to do some sort of mix and match so we can try different things to see what fits everybody really well. I'll have to think about that for some upcoming videos, I think. Nine inch circulars, I'm trying those. Oh, I'd like to know your opinion on those. I have not tried those yet. I do use um, four inch knitting needle tips for my interchangeables because my hands are, my fingers are short, so I prefer shorter needles. And I like those, but it seems like nine inch circular, circulars would be really quite smaller. They about two or three inches, the length of those needles, I'm guessing. So I haven't gotten those yet, but they sound really interesting. I'd like to give them a try too. You'll have to keep us updated, Deanne, and tell, you how, tell us how you like those. Hey, that looks like all of our questions for the week. <clears throat> so if you are interested in one of these topics for our upcoming live streams, then leave a chat or a comment and tell us which one is most interesting to you. I will try to put a poll up probably on Saturday with these choices and we can get some more feedback to see which topics we should cover next. And before we're done, I just want to give a shout out to Kendra and Kelly for buying me a coffee. I, I announced this in the newsletter. If you're, if you're not a subscriber, you can head to tanyanits.com and look for the 
let me see, the Reading Your Stitches guide. And once you sign up for that, you can, um, you'll be on the mailing list. And I just send about an email a week, just about the upcoming videos and things you might have missed. And one of the things I announced is that I'm trying to save up for a new webcam. I can, you can tell probably from the, the um, quality of this video, it's not that great because I'm just using the built-in camera and I don't really have the budget to, to purchase a webcam right now. So I thought that I would just leave a link. So if anybody wants to um, help purchase that, then that's the goal is to, is to buy a webcam. But please don't feel like you have to. I just want to shout out Kendra and Kelly because they did. And everything is still going to remain exactly the same. You don't have to pay for anything here. This is just another way of helping support the channel if you want to. But just showing up for the live streams, chatting with me, giving videos thumbs up and watching them, that is all wonderful ways to support me. And I really appreciate it. But just wanted to shout them out because I it's it's just nice that people are helping grow things around here. And I appreciate all of you so much. So I think that will wrap things up for the day. And if you if we didn't get to your question, I will go through the chat again um, probably next week or I'm going to look down in the comments and see what questions people are asking and we'll address them in the next video. Let me get back up here. There we go. So if you're catching the live stream, then I'll put a playlist right here for back podcast episodes so you can catch up and see what we've been chatting and knitting about, what we've been chatting about and knitting. <laughs> My words are having trouble coming out now. But um, it's been really fun hanging out with all of you today. Thanks for being here, Franca and Marina and Kaz and Deanne. It's been wonderful. And get knitting this week. And, and we'll be back in two weeks to talk about more knitting questions and answers. Bye till then.